Good evening, everyone. I am Hélène Ray, Professor of Economics at London Business School. Welcome to this Wheeler Institute event. The Wheeler Institute has been created thanks to uh, the support of Tony and Maureen Wheeler, who are the founders of uh, Lonely Planet. It is a research institute focusing on the role of business in addressing social and economic challenges in frontier low-income uh, and emerging economies. This evening event is the first of a series which is about rethinking capitalism. So welcome, and we are extremely fortunate to have with us uh, today Thomas Philippon and uh, Martin Wolf. Thomas is a professor at uh, NYU Stern, and uh, he is recipient of uh, multiple academic awards in macroeconomics and finance. Thomas has also a distinguished career in the policy world. He was in particular the senior economic advisor to the French Minister of Finance in 2012 and 2013. I actually met Thomas a very long time ago when he was a student at MIT. I remember the French expat community in Cambridge, Mass, having very interesting and heated discussions at the time, comparing the uh, European economy and the US economy. And interestingly, such comparison play a very important role in Thomas' fascinating new book, which is The Great Reversal, How America Gave Up on Free Markets. And this is the book we're going to discuss today. So in that book, Thomas paints a picture of the US plagued with monopolies and oligopolies. And this is very much in contrast with the European Union being better able to guarantee competition in product markets. Who would have thought? What a great reversal indeed. But to ask Thomas tough questions, we're also very privileged to have Martin Wolf with us today. Since everybody reads Martin's column in BFT, he doesn't need any introduction really. Everyone knows the sharpness and the analytical power of his mind when he discusses important economic issues. He brings sanity and clarity in a world that needs it more and more by the day. So I just want to mention that, that Martin actually wrote a pretty glowing review of Thomas' book, but I'm really hoping that uh, Martin and Thomas will today find some really interesting things to disagree about so that we have a great discussion. Finally, my colleague Jose Ba Martinez, professor of economics, who is an expert in technological change and who happens to be also Thomas' student, will moderate the Q&A and explain the ground rules. Over to you, Joseba. Thank you, Alain. Uh, good evening, everybody, or afternoon or morning, depending where you are. I'll add my welcome. Thank you so much, Thomas. Thank you, Martin, for uh, joining us today. Um, so the grand rules are as follows. Tomai will give an overview of the book for about 15, 20 minutes, and then uh, followed by a discussion between Martin and Tomai. Finally, at the end, uh, we'll have a Q&A uh, with the audience, which I'll be moderating. So please, uh, throughout uh, the presentation, throughout the discussion, post your questions on the Q&A function, uh, and I'll put those to uh, Tomai and to Martin. And if you'd like to tell us your name and your affiliation, uh, we'll try to mention those as well. Okay, that's it for me. So without uh, anything further, Thomas, it's a great pleasure. A welcome and uh, thank you again. Well, thank you very much uh, for, for having me. It's a pleasure to see everyone. I wish I could be uh, there with you physically, but uh, I know we're gonna have a great discussion uh, nonetheless. Um, I shall do my best, Hélène, to disagree with Martin, although it is not always easy for two reasons. One is, um, that I usually agree with what he writes, and two is whenever I disagree, he happens to be right most of the time. Um, nonetheless, I'll tell you about the book. Um, so the, the title, The Great Reversal, to some extent, Ellen already mentioned a little bit uh, the motivation. So uh, when I arrived in the US 20 years ago, it was striking that the US had more consumer-friendly markets than, than Europe had. When we say competitive market, what we really mean is consumer-friendly. That is, for, the, from a, for an economist, the market is competitive if consumers have low prices and lots of choices. Okay, that's exactly what we mean. And it was strikingly so in the US. You could get cheap internet connections, you could get cheap uh, laptops, computer equipment, uh, all kinds of electronics, 
you could uh, buy a cell phone, the cell phone plan was cheap, and you could fly to conferences because airlines were competitive and airline tickets were cheap enough that even me as a student, you know, I could afford it. So that was the US 20 years ago, uh, where actually I met uh, Ellen for the first time in, in Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts. And the book is called The Great Reversal because this has changed. So let's start with one of the prime example, the cost of uh, internet access at home. So this shows you the broadband cost per month for the same speed, right? So for the same quality of product. As you can see, every country in the world is somewhere between 30 and $40 per month. Um, so France, Korea, Germany, the UK, uh, Japan, all of these countries, um, Italy, Spain, all of, all of them are in this ballpark. Uh, but the US is twice as high as everybody else. Okay. So literally, if you're a US household and you want to have a broadband connection at home, you're paying twice what the same household would pay in London or in Manchester. Okay. So that is a big change. In fact, it's a reversal because the US used to be cheaper. Now, how did that happen? Well, in the telecom industry, over the past 20 years, there's been a wave of consolidation and increasing markups. So um, 2000, that's a sweet spot. That's where I got to uh, arrived in the US. As you can see, uh, concentration and markups are very low. So markup is in green, concentration is in red. The markup is, you can think of it mostly as a profit margin, like the, how much they are making for each unit of revenues. Um, and it, it has gone up by about 40, per, 40 percentage points, which is a very large increase. Um, concentration measure on the right is CR8. That's the market share of the top eight firms. Um, this is very volatile for many reasons, uh, but you can see there's a clear upward drift by about 20 uh, percentage points over this uh, 20 or 30 over this sample period. So a very large increase in concentration, a very large increase in profit margins, and a very large increase in prices. Um, so what, is it just the telecom industry or is it more broadly true in the US? Well, let's zoom out. Let's look at the entire non-financial business sector. And this is the profit margin. So it's profit over value added. It used to fluctuate around 7%. Of course, profit margins are cyclical. Every time there is a recession, profits tend to go down faster than GDP. So profit over value added tends to go down. But the fluctuations, as you can see, tended to occur around 7%. Now they still fluctuate, but around a higher mean of something like 10%. So again, a sharp increase in profit margin. That's for the entire non-financial business sector. Concentration is harder to measure correctly because we don't always have the same level of granularity that we would like. Um, so this, these are proxies using uh, industry codes. Bro uh, here I break down by manufacturing in green, non-manufacturing in red. And as you can see in both cases, uh, an increase in concentration by about something like six points, maybe seven points. Um, to give you a sense, because the baseline is around 0.2, it's a little bit like if you had an industry typically that had four large firms 20 years ago, today that industry would have three large firms. Okay. That would give you a sense of what happened uh, for the median industry. So these facts are not that controversial, um, although they are measurement issues that we can come back to. What is very controversial is what they mean is the interpretation. And, you know, at the risk of simplifying a bit, I'm going to call them good and bad concentration. These are the two polar interpretation. The good concentration is when you think that the, the increase in concentration that you see is happening because firms that were already very good, that were already industry leaders, have just become even better. Okay, so then as a consequence of that, their market share is going to grow. You're going to measure higher concentration. But it's not necessarily a bad thing. It just means they, they are just getting better. Maybe they are running faster than the rest. And therefore, their productivity is going up. Uh, and so is the productivity of their industry. So maybe everybody's benefiting from it. Typically, it comes together with a lot of intangible investment when you see that in the data. And the bad concentration 
explanation is exactly the opposite. It says that, no, no, the reason these firms manage to maintain such high profit margins and market shares is because they are preventing entry. They are preventing competition. And uh, therefore, you don't expect any good outcomes. And in fact, under the bad concentration hypothesis, you would expect high prices and low productivity. It's not hard to find examples of both in the US. Uh, clearly, if you look at the retail and wholesale trade sectors, they, they fit very well the good concentration story. If you look at telecoms, airlines, and healthcare, they fit quite well the bad concentration uh, story. But you know, what about all the industries in between? Are they more or less uh, in the good camp or in the bad camp? Okay, so that's what I'm trying to do. And uh, once we understand that, we can start asking questions about technology versus policy. That is, is there something we can do about it, or is that some unavoidable consequence of technological change? So. Just so that we all agree on the, the basic principle, this is an example of good concentration from the perspective of consumers. So Walmart entered the market. Uh, it started to grow very quickly in the 1980s. Uh, its market share went from essentially zero to 60% over a span of 20 years. So that's an amazing growth. Okay? It was all driven by innovation, by investment in information technology, just-in-time inventory management. In fact, many of the technologies that are used today in retail around the world were invented or pioneered or developed or at least uh, improved uh, by Walmart. But as Walmart expanded, its profit margin in green was flat, if anything, slightly falling. What that's telling you is that every 1% increase in productivity that was achieved by this new technology was passed on as a 1% drop in prices for consumers. That's why it was a good deal. That's why this is the kind of concentration that we think is good concentration. It doesn't mean that it doesn't hurt. It doesn't mean it doesn't put many other business out of business. It doesn't mean it doesn't have potentially uh, you know, difficult consequences on the labor market. Sure, it can. But at the very least, it brings improvement, lower prices, and higher standards of living uh, to consumers. The other thing that's interesting with Walmart is uh, it also exemplifies the way capitalism is supposed to work. Because by the early 2000s, when Walmart is at 60% of its market, and people start to worry about antitrust issues with Walmart, the fact that it's becoming too dominant, it has too much market power, and maybe actually we should do something again. Maybe we should have an antitrust action against Walmart. Right at the time where we started to worry about it, the solution came from the market itself. In fact, in the name of Amazon, who entered that space, from a completely different perspective from the online retail space and started competing successfully with Walmart. So in fact, we never had to do something drastic against Walmart because competition was created by the capitalist system. This is how it's supposed to work. My main claim in the book is that this is not working like that anymore. Um, so I go through all kinds of uh, measurements of competition in the US and I show that whether you look at uh, profit margin, prices, in, uh, investment in intangible asset, productivity growth, investment, um, entry, turnover at the top of industries, all of these point toward the fact that there's been less competition in many industries. Now, if you look at the data very broadly with all these proxies at the same time, you can construct an index of good and bad concentration. The one called intangible, PC1, so it's the, the first bulk of data based on intangibles, it's because it loads heavily on intangible. It tells you this is concentration, but it comes together with intangible investment and fast productivity growth. And as you can see, it's increasing in the 90s and then it's kind of flat. So I'm not saying it's disappearing. I'm not saying that there is no industry today that goes through this good cycle of concentration. They are, there are always some. But what is striking is that the other type of concentration, the one where we don't see all the good stuff, we don't see the productivity, the low prices and stuff like that. This has become relatively more important in recent years. And today, it's actually more prevalent than the green type. Okay, so that's my main claim about the US. At this point, you want to ask yourself, well, is it more technology or is it more policy? Is that something we should be doing? <clears throat> that's a tricky question, obviously, uh, because you know, we don't know uh, exactly what's driving this concentration. And it's very hard to disentangle technology from policy because typically the two move together. That's where Europe is especially interesting because there are some industries, in fact, most industries where Europe and the US use the same technology. If you think about the telecom industry, airlines, uh, essentially all the transportation industry, 
all the consumer goods. Pretty much the technology is exactly the same in Europe and in the US. Now that's not exactly true for the, the big tech firms because Google and Amazon, Amazon is different, but Google and Facebook are purely American companies. We don't have the equivalent. So I'm gonna forget about Google, Amazon for the next uh, three or four slides. I'm excluding them from the analysis. I'm looking at all the industries that have the same types of firms on both sides of the Atlantic. And I'm gonna see whether the evolution is the same in Europe. Um, and it's not. And it's part because Europe has tried to push to make its market more competitive over the same period of time. So starting in the late, mid to late 90s, as we move toward the single market, um, we start to implement product market reforms. So PMR is a product market reform index. And this is telling you that at the peak around 2000, we have one major reform per country per year. What's a PMR reform? Well, here's a, one of my favorite examples, the telecom reform in France. So this is when we introduce a fourth competitor in an industry that used to be dominated by three incumbents. So throughout the 2000s, we have three major um, wireless carriers and the classic oligopoly, they all charge the same price. There's a fourth entrant, Free Mobile, who's asking for a license. Um, Got den uh, gets denied its license under heavy lobbying by the incumbent. And then in 2011, the regulator give free a license, a bunch of spectrum so they can enter. When they enter, they enter exactly at half the price of the incumbent. The incumbent were providing the unlimited texting, voice, and you know, bunch of gigabytes of data for 20 euros per month, free, so for 40 euros per month, sorry, free enters at 20 euros per month, so half the price. And within two years, um, the, the incumbents had to match right, because they were losing customers. So that, what that means is that even if you did not change your cell phone plan, then the price on your uh, mobile, mobile plan would essentially be divided by two in two years. So that's a huge improvement in your standards of living. That's all because of entry. So that's one example of PMR. If you accumulate the PMRs over time, it looks like that. So this is an index of the level of regulation or the level of, you know, regulation that hurt competition in Europe. Uh, four would be the worst and zero would be the best. And every green dot is a country in Europe. Um, the US is a red line. As you can see that the first vintage of data that we have from the second half of the 90s, every country in Europe has more regulation, more anti-competitive regulation than the US, except for one country. And I'm sure you can guess, yes, this is the UK, right? The UK was, the only country in Europe with a tradition of free market. And you know, if you follow from one vintage to the next, maybe you, I wouldn't blame you for not noticing much because it doesn't change very quickly. But if you accumulate over 20 years, you see it's always moving in the same direction. By the end of the sample, every country in Europe is about the same as Europe. In fact, if anything, slightly less regulated. And so that's, the, that's what happened in Europe. And then consumers saw what? Well, they saw lower prices thanks to that. So if you look at the markup changes, so this is the markup, that's the price relative to unit cost of labor. It's about flat, slightly declining in Europe. It's increasing in the US. It's increasing. And my, based on this uh, analysis, my estimates, my best uh, estimate is that prices in the US are about 7% too high. So 7% too high, that's about $300 per month per household. It's about $600 billion of consumer spending per year, if you put 12 months and all the households together. And it corresponds to a waste of a trillion dollar of private GDP in the following sense. Suppose you took the economy as it is today and you made it as competitive as it was 20 years ago. So you would get rid of this extra 7% uh, distortion then standard macroeconomic model predict that private GDP would go up by about $1 trillion. And on top of it, because you would push down profit margins, you would push up labor income. So labor income would go up by in fact more than a trillion dollars. Profit would go down by a quarter of a trillion and labor income would go up by a trillion and a quarter. So the main beneficiary would be the middle class. So the middle class, for people who earn around 50,000, for households earning about $50,000 per year, that would be a 10% improvement in their standards of living. So what happened? Well, I'm sure we can come back to what happened in Europe. Happy to answer any question. There's a paradox, of course, it's weird that it happened like that in Europe, but I am happy to explain that 
uh, afterwards. Um, the US is more complicated. I don't think I have a full understanding of what happened, why it happened, when. Um, I can point to a couple of proxy um, explanations. And the main one is lobbying, which is, if you think about what is it that changed in the 2000s, together with all these negative evolutions, well, clearly lobbying did. Okay, so this is the evolution of lobbying in the US. As, and now I have data going back further. I can show that it was quite stable uh, as a share of GDP, for instance, in the uh, 90s and late 80s. But somewhere around 2000, it started to increase a lot um, and reach levels that are about two or three times higher than Europe. Okay, so lobbying is not something firms do for fun. They do it because they have a definite goal in mind. And usually this goal is to influence regulations, regulators or policymakers uh, in their favor. And for whatever reason, started doing more of it in the 2000s and they started to be more successful in the 2000s. This is how you sustain a system where prices are high, profit margins are high, consumer get a bad deal and somehow the policymaker don't do anything. So we said 15 to 20 minutes, so I'm done and I'm happy to answer any questions. And that was a very good uh, summary of some of the conclusions. Um, I know Hélène is going to be desperately disappointed, but I gave it a very favorable review because I thought it was a very good book. Um, and uh, so I'm going to have to, to work quite hard to find points of really big disagreement. I think before we go into sort of the, some of the issues, I think it would be very, very useful because it's so fascinating if you elaborated your view on why and how the political, why the political economy of competition policy in Europe evolved in the way it did and, uh, and what was special about the relationship between the member states that drove this, after all, very surprising outcome. It's 20 years ago, or 25 years ago, the idea that the whole EU would become so much more competitive would have seemed almost like a joke. So what do you think went on? Yeah, so um, it's striking that if you read the papers, the books written at the time, nobody saw it coming. I don't think I would have seen it if, if I had been writing at the time, for sure. Um, so the paradox is as follows. Suppose you take 18 countries, uh, which as you saw in the data, right, except for the UK, none of the other ones had the tradition of free market. And, by, and free market is an ecosystem, right? So free market means uh, that the, um, the political system supports independent regulators and the independent regulators are there to uh, enforce free market by being tough uh, on competition. So none of the countries in Europe had this tradition of free market. Now you put 18 of them, or depending on the time, 12 or 14, or, but say 18, you put 18 of them around the table and you ask them to design institution for the EU. Now think about it. And you know, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Well, I think most of us, would, our intuition would be, well, they're probably gonna do the same thing they were doing at home, just gonna, on the larger scale. Okay, so that's the basic, the theory of the EU as being some kind of average of pre-existing conditions. And what's striking about EU institutions is that to a large extent, this is not true. The EU institution is not the average of the member state institution. That is not true for the ECB and it is not true for the DigiComp. So what's the game? Why is it that it's like that? I think the, the answer is that countries understand that once you play the game at the EU level, the game is different. So if you're, if you're the Ministry of Finance in France and you deal with French issues, then you want to keep your power. That is, you want to have the right to influence mergers, to influence industrial policy. So you don't like regulators to tell you what to do. Uh, there is no countervailing force to that, except of course you are accountable to, uh, to citizens. So they're gonna vote if you do a really bad policy that hurts them, they're gonna vote you up. But at the margin, you're gonna balance the two. Now, if you do the same thing at the EU level, you still have your desire to influence the EU. Okay? Every country would love to influence the EU in their, in their favor, in their direction, obviously. But they understand that there's a countervailing force, which is the other countries could team up and influence the EU against them. <laughs> that did not exist at the local level. That did not exist at the member state level. That's only an EU phenomenon. And so what happens is that if you know you're gonna be in a, a union with 18 or 28 uh, members, 
then it becomes even more important for the referee to be independent. If you know you're going to win the game, you, you might, you, you're happy to bribe the referee. But if you're, going, if you're in a game with other people and you can't predict the outcome, then you want the referee to be fair and independent. And so that's what happened. The French were worried that the Germans could influence the commission against them. The Germans were worried that the French would be able to influence the commission against them. The other smaller countries were worried of joining a union with two large countries who could you know, team up and influence the regulation in their favor. And so if they were to agree on anything, it would have to be a very independent referee, which is exactly what they did for the DG Comp. And by the way, that's also what they did with the ECB. For the same, for essentially the same reasons, which is that's how we solve the paradox of of the EU, in my opinion. So the um, uh, the result, I mean, one way I was thinking about this after um, we've discussed this before. I mean, in a way, it, it suggests that there is a competition benefit to having a political decentralized, politically decentralized setup. That if yep. the EU had a had the federal government that many people want, then the logic would suggest it would might well be captured in the way that, that your argument suggests the US federal government has ultimately been captured. Yep, that's that's one of the example where um, the the lack of um, some lack of political unity uh, can be a good thing in these guys. It's an interesting, it has an interesting resonance for people who know the debate about the Renaissance in Europe and why is it that Europe was the invented modern capitalism. One argument that historians have given is precisely the lack of a centralized power. Yes. I mean, it's, it's, what, there are other theories, but one of the interesting theory for China versus Europe um, in explaining why Europe you know, became so much richer than China uh, you can't explain that based on technology because the Chinese were, if anything, more advanced than the Europeans. Um, they had better writing. They had better everything. The state was running more, more efficiently. So based on this, you would predict China is the one who should have become much richer. And somehow it happened in Europe. And one argument we'll give is that it's precisely the fact that all of these local kingdoms were fighting against each other. So if you have a good idea and your local king doesn't like it and try to put you in jail, well, you can move to the next kingdom. And that means that good ideas could not be trapped. Technological improvement could not be trapped. Inventions could not be trapped. And uh, that's why Europe became richer. So that's one of the examples where maybe not having the fully centralized power can be a good thing. Would the implication of that be, in your view, if, if we're looking to the future, that even though there's now a lot of discussion in Europe in the context of the last few years, and continuing now that we need more, that Europe need the EU, I can't use the word we anymore, uh, that uh, the, um, that you need more industrial policy, you need economic champions, uh, uh, you need more protection against foreign competitors, that actually this is very unlikely to happen on your analysis because the French would say, well, if there's going to be a national and European champion, it'll probably be a German company, and we don't want that, and vice versa. Um, but maybe against that, you could argue, well, actually, they might agree to create an Airbus in every, in, in every major industry, um, and that would be pretty bad. How stable, in other words, do you think this competitive equilibrium that you describe actually is? Yeah, so I think it's been tested, but not fully tested. So. Um, if you think about the thing that could make it less less stable, uh, one clearly was the UK, actually, because it's very clear that one of the reasons we have pro-market institutions in Europe is that the UK was very much at the center of the negotiation when these institutions were created. Mm -hmm. That's very clear. Now, you might ask us, well, if the UK leaves now, where does it leave Europe? I mean, are we going to revert to uh, old-fashioned policies? Uh, I mean, it's who knows? My own, my own guess is no. It's no because uh, it's a DNA issue. It's like it is in the DNA of the EU now. Uh, and that's not going to change. You would have to change the treaty and there will never be agreement. So I, I think that's fine. Um, the, the, the one that uh, worries me more is actually uh, China. And I know that's also a worry that you, you write a lot about. 
because China is so large and powerful that it scares the heck out of many people and it can push them to adopt very silly policies. I mean, we know policymakers tend to make silly policies when they are scared. Uh, and in the case of China, there are reasons to be worried, but there is also a host of lobbyists ready to use these reasons to push for bad policies. So um, to some extent, we had an early test of that in the siemens Alstom merger. Uh, you know, enlightenment prevailed. Uh, so I think to me, it's a very strong test that, um, but it's not guaranteed, it's not foolproof. Um, I think on the other hand, that um, it would be useful to have a bit more of an aggressive trade policy at the EU level. I think that uh, there are issues with uh, trade agreements and the lack of uh, reciprocity in public market. And I, I wouldn't mind the EU to be more assertive in that dimension. In fact, I'm worried sometimes that if we are not assertive on the trade side, we're going to think of it as a second best solution to start to curtail competition to create national champions. And I think that would be a bad outcome. I don't see it as a big threat right now, but it is a threat. If you go back in history, I, would, well, I was reminded one of the first books uh, um, on political economy I read was Seven Schreiber's Le De Défi Américain, which you're talking yeah. about the Chinese equivalent of that. So it has been a recurrent theme in Europe, indeed, uh, uh, for quite a while that you're falling, we're falling behind uh, whoever the technological leader of the moment is. And that leads to these strong temptations towards industrial policy uh, and the creation of, of, in this case, European champions. That's true. Although the thing with the US is that, uh, to some extent, the fact that we were falling behind led us to think about what is it that they are doing right. And thankfully, at the time where we asked ourselves that question in the 90s, we saw the US as a place of free market, and we thought maybe free market is a good idea. So I think there's always value in looking at what other countries are doing. The, the, the trouble with China is that money is a bit less applicable. Um, and um, I also, I, I, there's another dimension to that, which is, you know, we shouldn't think that China's rise is going to continue smoothly forever. Like, I think there's also an excess of optimism about, I mean, there is no, China doesn't change the law of gravity. If they crack down on private enterprise, if they come back with state owned enterprises and they prevent, you know, private uh, entrepreneurs from innovating, they will go back to slow growth. You know, uh, it's just that it's not going to happen overnight. And in the meantime, much damage can be done. I actually think it's already happening, but that's another subject. We can, we can forget that. Let's turn to the US side of your story. Um, so the US was seen, I think, for pretty good reason as a highly competitive economy um, for most of the 20th century, actually, um, after the, the trust busting of the early 20th century, this wasn't the big problem that FDR was trying to deal with, the failure of any sort of welfare provision, and of course the Great Depression. So it's sort of really surprising that, as it were, suddenly, from your, the, this point of view, in the last 20 years, the sort of the lobbying exploded and your, your story and com competition eroded so rapidly. So what's the political economy explanation of this? Probably the Alberto Alessina question, since we are mourning his death, I was thinking about this. Um, what's the political economy that transformed America in your story? Is this ideas, are these the product of ideas? Uh, um, of ideas about competition, ideas about po the political power of companies, about corporate donations, to what do you attribute this extraordinary turnaround? Very good point. Uh, in fact, I, I, because of writing the book, I did spend more time uh, talking to Alberto Alesina in, in recent years, and it was always a pleasure and amazingly insightful. Um, little did I know that would be the last time I would talk to him. Um, so I think that, so first of all, Let's be clear that many people who have been looking at the um, antitrust don't think that this is a, a phenomenon of the 2000s. They think it goes back to the 70s. In fact, they think it's a, it's a slow 
erosion of uh, antitrust standards uh, following Bork and excess trust in market from the Chicago School, uh, clearly unwarranted in some aspect. Um, so they think of it as something that starts in the 80s and start with essentially teaching generations of new judges how to think in a way that concludes that merger are always okay. And monopoly power is nothing you need to worry about because if profits are high, it's going to attract competition, it's going to solve the problem for you. Uh, take it as given. So they think that this kind of uh, uh, brainwashing is too strong, but this kind of influence on the, the, the ideology of, of judges has started in the 80s. And then what we see today is just the long term outcome of that. I think there's some truth to that. In some other industries, it's clear there are some shocks. So um, I still, I'm still puzzled by September 11th, to be honest. I think we underestimate the, the shock, uh, how deep it, it was. I mean, in, in some proxy sense, um, it's obvious that it had a huge impact on the airlines. So the, the, if you just want to understand why airlines went from eight to four uh, with a huge increase in market power, well, clearly the trigger point was 9-11, so that's clear. But it also had, a, it, it shook the political system to a large extent and um, it allowed a bunch of uh, laws that would have been un, you know, unthinkable in the US earlier to, to be put in place. Um, I think probably there's something there, but it's hard to be sure because I don't know how to test these ideas. Um, but what we do see in the data is somewhere around that period of time, we see a relaxation of uh, pro-competition uh, policies across the board. Um, and the only question today is, you know, can we go back? In terms of going back, there would seem to be two requirements. First, a transformed political environment, rather difficult to wish, though you could possibly change ideas, and then a change in the operation of political institu of regulatory institutions in an environment where you don't have this competition among governments that you describe in Europe. Um, can you imagine any way that those two things could happen? And if so, what the reg would the regulatory institution at the end of the this look just like the Europeans? Is that actually the right way to do this? Well, there's, there's many ways to be, uh, to be uh, very pessimistic uh, in, in, when you think about these questions. The best way to be pessimistic is to think that it has to start in Washington. Because if you think it has to start in Washington, then you know it's a non-starter. Um, so the reason I'm not fully pessimistic is because I don't think it has to start in Washington. I think uh, for, for different reasons. The first one is, Within the U.S., you see you see some improvement at the local level, at the state level. Um, you see uh, governors trying to simplify their codes, uh, re remove some ex uh, licensing requirement that had been piled up over the past 20 years, um, and they understand that it's better for their citizens. Um, I think states still compete to some extent um, for good institutions. So I think that at the state level there is more room. There is also less ideology. If you look at the, the it's very striking that the older um, generation of Republicans, although at least the ones that are left, the, the ones that are left in power, are extremely ideological to an extent which is kind of scary. But it's not true of the slightly younger generation. Um, many of them on issues of climate change or inequality, well, they are conservative, they are Republican, but they are not ideologically uh, blind. Okay, so I think that there's much more room there for what used to be the, the, to me at least, the key feature of the US, which is the pragmatic middle ground approach where we can ro reach across the aisle to just get something done. You know, they, so to me, that was the, the, the hallmark of the US. I think that can be regained, not in Washington anytime soon, I agree with that, but at the state level. Um, where Washington is going to become a big issue is the Supreme Court, because I think it's hard to imagine a sustainable solution without some kind of regulation of campaign finance, and campaign finance has to go through the Supreme Court. So that part is very hard. The second reason I'm slightly optimistic is because the U.S., I mean, what happened in Europe was uh, uh, EU institutions, but also a lot of uh, watching what our neighbors do, like a lot of benchmarking. Like, you know, every time we talk about the labor market in France, we start by talking about Denmark. Uh, you know, every time we talk about pension reform, we start by talking about Sweden. Every time we, we talk about um, 
how to bring young people uh, the skills required to be successful in the labor market. We start by talking about Germany. So that's actually happening. And I am beginning to see a bit of that in the US. In the, in the debate about the healthcare system, uh, finally, you know, the first argument is, look, look, let's look at what happens in other countries. And people are more aware of that. Um, in the telecom, when I give my books in the US, usually this, the, the price of telecom is something that people are acutely aware of. They know they are getting ripped off. I mean, when they pay 300, when you pay two or three hundred dollars per month for your telecom bill, that is just for having broadband and say one or two cell phones. Yes, you think it's crazy, and people are aware of it. So I think that's that's kind of a good start. Um, and hopefully, you know, I do believe we have we have room for, um, you know, it's not co it's not cooperation internationally. It's just you know useful uh, competition. Oh, here's another example, I guess. That's even better. You know, think about uh, two great examples of the US helping the EU and the EU helping the US. If it was not for a small uh, bunch of kids running an NGO and later for uh, the California regulator, we would still be killing people in Europe with diesel engines. Okay, The diesel gate was entirely uncovered in the US. And why not in Europe? Pure corruption. Of course, everybody knew they were just paid to look the other way. It was utter corruption at the EU level, in fact, in every member state. And the truth came from, from, from the US. Okay, so clearly in that case, it's obvious that EU citizens benefited greatly. It's a pure public good. Right? We didn't pay for any of that, and we got the information thanks to the US. On the flip side, uh, if you think about regulation of data, privacy, internet giants, the US has done nothing in the past 10 years because of corruption or because of lobbying, if you want to be polite. But they essentially, they bought the regulator, they bought the politician, nothing has happened. Europe doesn't have the same issue. So we try to do a few things. So when now they themselves want to, uh, you know, try to improve their legislations, at least they can get inspiration from Europe and they can also see what didn't work in Europe. So they don't do the same. So I think this kind of cross, um, you know, exchange of ideas, I think is useful. Again, here, my, my main issue is China. Because I don't know if we can do that with China. That's uh, certainly a, uh, a um, very interesting question, which I'll put aside for one moment. Now, when you present this in America, I imagine there will, well, I want to explore this, but I imagine there will be a sort of pushback, which will sort of say, well, this isn't basically a fairy story. Um, we're we are more productive here. We our productivity growth has not been great, but it certainly matched that of Europe. Uh, recently, uh, and that's continued to be true after the financial crisis. We're the country with all the great new global companies. You've just listed a whole slew of them, um, none of which existed thirty years ago. Um, we remain the land of high-tech, innovation, what's coming out of Europe? They're all dead old companies. Um, and so really, it's, it's a fairy story, isn't it, Thomas? Yeah, so when, when you give the book in the US, you have two types of, uh, you have two types of reaction. The people who are mostly consumers and workers, they, kind of, they say, yeah, that's right. That's exactly what my experience is. Every time I buy something, it gets ripped off. The thing that matter, you know, not like you, you buy a, pasta at the supermarket yeah that's cheap okay but if you buy and if you want to get uh, again access to internet travel uh, energy costs healthcare to be just to keep your family healthy they know they are getting a horrible deal and they can't afford it so they, they, the convincing is actually uh, very easy to some extent when you talk to uh, people who are more like ceos then it's a more it's more mixed um, then it's then you get more granular you get okay is that true for that industry not that industry. For people who know the telecom industry, I think there is no doubt. That's easy. Airlines, I think after a while, the people are convinced too. Then the big issue is the, the big tech. And, but there, I think I'm totally happy to, uh, to, to argue that the US is going to remain at the leading edge of tech, with or without China, um, over, the, over the next 20 years. My point is just that uh, you know, the US used to have a system where with three pillars, knowledge centers, university, private research lab, uh, an ecosystem for nurturing companies with funding, 
and access to a single market immediately and very competitive market that gives consumer a good deal. These three pillars were the greatness of the US economy. They just lost one pillar, they still have two. So the two is better than, than one in Europe. So I think in that sense, they still dominate, but they could do better. So you, one of the points then is you would still go to Europe and say, look, the US still has some pretty damn good things and you should be trying to get them. Or oh yeah, I think we successfully copied their, their antitrust and, and now we need to do the same thing for universities, private research labs and, uh, and uh, financial markets. Let's talk about, because it's such a big subject of conversation, I have these discussions almost every week at the FT on tech. I mean, one could think, I was interested in, you repeated this very interesting discussion of good competition, good concentration and bad concentration. So is it clear which side the tech firms lie? Because I would have thought they're sort of both. Yes, I think uh, I, I would. I don't think anybody could argue that they are all on one side or on the other. I think that um, um, first of all, there is very little doubt that the way they got there was mostly good, in the sense mm -hmm. that you know they uh, they just they just outcompeted their um, their would be competitors initially. So I think the reason we have Google, Facebook, and these other guys, and Amazon in particular, is because they just got, they just showed that they were better than the rest. So that's the way they got there. Now, how they are staying there, that's a lot more controversial. I think the way they are staying there, because now they are they're spending a lot on lobbying, they are fighting every regulation that could you know, have an impact on what they do. Uh, and they do a bunch of, um, you know, well, from killer acquisitions, to uh, making sure that uh, you know uh, they have a reputation for for getting rid of any kind of would-be competitor, I think uh, that's what they do today to prevent competition. Um, so to make it look as if they are really natural monopolies, I don't think they are natural monopolies. I think it's a market where naturally the firms have to be large, but I think the idea that they are natural monopolies, I think it's it's too strong. Um, beyond that, I think you have to go firm by firm. For instance, I actually have a I'm much more bullish on Amazon than I am on uh, Facebook or Google, for instance. Uh, I think Amazon, if you look at the big picture, it's mostly value added. I mean, I think maybe you could make the case that they, they cheat on, they, they skip taxes, they cheat on their taxes like every big company does. I think that's a shame. I think it's a global problem. We should do something about it. But by and large, you know, they operate in two businesses, retail and, and the cloud. The retail is very competitive their margins are not that high. And the reason they are successful is because they are just darn good. Uh, the cloud is still competitive. So I think there you could have a question mark as to you know, how many competitors do we need to keep the cloud competitive? Two, three, four, I don't know. Um, but I, if you look at Google, I think it's hard to look at the Google, if you, you have to look at the entire online advertising market without just seeing a massive uh, conflict of interest. Especially if you, like me, you come from the financial market side and you look at what they do. They run auctions, so an auction like you, know, like you would do for trading stocks or bonds, but they run an auction, but they can advise and participate in the auction at the same time. You know, like that just makes no sense. This is kind of conflict of interest to me is very problematic. So I think that's where I would like to see more action. Now that suggests, and I was gonna come, that you see the solutions as regulatory for big tech. Um, now, there are other people who think a crucial element is preventing acquisitions, particularly acquisitions of potential competitors. If you, there's a long list, you can think of you know, WhatsApp, uh, uh, Instagram, so lots of them that have been swapped, and that should be just be stopped. In fact, they should be forced to disgorge these companies. Um, uh, um, the um, some propose comprehensive breakups, um, and then there are people who who are talking about detailed uh, behavioural regulation. Um, it, what, where do you fall, or is it actually going to end up firm specific because they really are operating in quite different markets? I think it's going to end up being firm specific. I think that the pragmatic approach there is probably to try a bit of everything. Um, I think most people 
think I mean, most people who know th this market understand that the antitrust tool is very, very blunt. Uh, it's also very slow. Um, and, uh, you know, so even if today you tried hard to break up, to separate, say, uh, Instagram from Facebook, it would take many, many years. The, the, issue, the outcome would be very uncertain. Um, doesn't mean it's not worth a try. It just means you don't want to put all your eggs in the same basket. You, you can't just rely on, on antitrust. So I think you, I would try all of them. I would try to do some clear antitrust uh, based on principle that uh, either market dominance or the fact that if you're running a, a platform, a marketplace, you cannot also operate in that marketplace as a, as a buyer or seller. Um, so that seems like to be principle that are pretty sensible. We could try to apply that and for separation if, if needed or just regulate them, you know, uh, that like we do in financial markets. Uh, which one is going to end up being successful? I do not know, but I, I don't think there is potentially a solution without doing both. Clearly, in some cases, for example, if you want to slow down their acquisition going forward, I think we all agree that needs to happen. That's going to be antitrust. Um, on the other hand, uh, antitrust is very slow and very blunt. So the only way to keep, to keep up with what they are doing is some form of regulation. So I think you need to do both. I don't think there's much, much doubt about that. Um, One of the points you make in the book, which, we, which I thought was very interesting, is that these companies, which we think of as such colossi, are not actually more dominant than the super big companies of the past. Um, could you discuss that? And because, you know, you sort of people think there's something about Google which is unique and different and um but you talk about general motors and so, so explain that point yeah that's the whole reinhardt rogoff uh, argument this time is different is usually you know either it's a very dangerous sentence or it's mostly wrong uh yeah i think by the way that might that's the one thing in the book that might age a little bit because of covid uh because all of the data i looked at was pre-covid uh so let's you know, let's keep that in mind. It certainly but, has yes. the tech giants, hasn't it? Yes, yes. It, it has a very large uh, composition effect there. So we, maybe I will have to revise that chapter. Um, but um, yeah, what I did was uh, think, well, I'm pretty sure people overestimate the extent these firms are great. There's no question they are great. The question is, are they great by historical standard? And um, so what I did is I looked at all the top firms in the US over the past 50 years, decade by decade. And if you look at the top firms of the 50s or 60s, the names are gonna change. You're gonna have General Motors, General Electric, AT&T, Procter and & Gamble, and IBM in the 70s. Um, but if you look at these say top five firms in the economy at any point in time, um, they share very similar features to uh, Microsoft and Google today. Uh, they are, the extent to which they are more productive by the rest, the, the extent to which they are more profitable than the rest, the extent to which their market value is higher than the rest, that's all the same. Essentially, uh, and again, un until COVID, if you looked at the market value of the top five firms in the US, it was 10% of the stock market. That was true in 1980. It was true in 2019. Uh, the names changed, except for one, uh, ExxonMobil, which is there throughout. Every, every, otherwise, they all change. But you know, it's like 10% of the stock market. So it's big, but it's not unprecedented big. So I think that's the usual uh, you know, bias people have in mind. They always think that whatever we do today is so much smarter and greater than what our grandparents were doing. That's just not true. They were just as smart as we are. And you know, they, are, they were just as innovative. And in fact, if you look at the data in terms of real outcome, if anything, they were doing better. Like uh, the time period of GE and GM, productivity growth was faster. And in yeah. part, thanks to these companies, they were, they were, they seem to have been better, maybe not so much at inventing new stuff, but at spreading it throughout the economy. That's, that seems to be true. Now, COVID has increased the concentration. So now I think today, yes, they are higher than, than, than the average. And the other difference, of course, which is not related to this is the old Colossus, Colossi um, employed a lot more people. Than these companies. Yeah, and that's, that's true. quite significant in terms of the social effect of these businesses. That's true, but there is one exception Amazon. Yeah. Amazon does employ a lot of people. Although yeah. controversially. I'd like to, before we end, I'd like to turn to a sector which I thought a lot about and you have, which is finance. 
mm -hmm. and um, in the US case, uh, it's a complicated story, but certainly in banking, um, the market has on most of the measures I've seen um, become notably more concentrated over time and the financial crisis accelerated that. The US, of course, has a lot bigger, what's called shadow banking, I don't know what you call it, um, financial intermediation outside the banking sector. So there would seem to be more competition there. The Europeans are much more bank dependent, but they have lots more of them, but they seem, many of them, very financially weak, but maybe that shows there's real competition. Um, the Americans would say, certainly Jamie Dimon would say, well, we are so big and profitable because we are so great. Um, I have, so I have an interest, uh, my interest is, is, is the, the banking sector in the US dangerously concentrated? And what are the implications of that in your view in either direction for financial stability, which is one of the concerns people have. There are obviously also the concerns, and you have very interesting material on this, which I'd like you to explore, on profitability in the financial sector, which as far as I can see, seems to be quite a general phenomenon, but maybe it's more the US. So I'd just like you to, in the last five minutes, to explore your perception of what's going on in finance, which is in some ways in your book, pretty horrifying. So I think finance also exemplifies some of these, uh, these trends. Um, I think that if I think about the US financial system today, if I am a small or medium sized company, or if I am a large company, I probably want to be in the US rather than Europe. I would have better funding opportunities and I would have tighter spread. On the other hand, if I'm a consumer, a household, there is absolutely no doubt that I'm much better off in Europe. Like the, the, the quality of services and the cost of services uh, as, as a, for, for households uh, is much higher in Europe. Yeah, I think it was already to some extent true a little bit before um, the crisis, but you know, bank, retail banking has become very competitive in Europe and, in, and very non-competitive non in, in many respects in the US and very antiquated too. Like the, you know, we think of the US as a place where IT system work better, but that's true except for retail banking. It's, yeah. a, it's really, really terrible. Um, and I think the only reason is lack of competition. Now, if you trace it back, uh, they haven't benefited the same, to the same extent as Europe of what we know called free banking or the fact that uh, you know, some of these fintech firms on the retail side are really competing with the banks to try to provide good financial services for cheap. Um, and in Europe, that's been encouraged by the regulator um, to, to a large extent successfully, I would argue, actually. Uh, so that now as a consumer, I get, I get a pretty good deal. Um, in, in the US, they killed, they, that means the big banks, uh, successfully killed all of the attempt to meaningfully increase uh, fintech competition by essentially uh, preventing uh, any kind of data sharing. Um, so, that's, so that's kind of another surprising, if you had told me 20 years ago that banking lobbies would be more successful in uh, the US than in France, I would have not believed you because I, the way I grew up in France was like the banks had such a close proximity with the politicians and they always get got their way. That's not true anymore. And I think that's also to a large extent because of the fact that we transfer regulation to the ECB and, and it's arm's length regulation. You know, like the, the, the rule in Europe now is the head regulator of any kind of large bank has to be from a different country. The head regulator of, of, of BNP Paribas cannot be French. The head regulator of Santander cannot be Spanish. I think that's just extremely healthy. Um, and um, so that's, on the other hand, if you look at financial markets, then clearly the US is better, even for consumers. So the one place where as a consumer are much better than in Europe is uh, asset management. I get asset management products that are extremely cheap super efficient. So that's the Vanguard effect. I'm still waiting for the Vanguard effect in continental Europe. The UK, of course, is a bit better in that dimension. So it's a mixed bag of the two. Um, and I think it's one of these places where both sides of the Atlantic could learn from the other if they were so inclined. Do you think the regular, this is the last question, do you think the regulators, because finance is really important, 
because it has the stability aspect and the yeah and the efficiency and the it's a very complicated sector do you think that regulators in both sides have been so concerned about stability that they've sort of forgotten about competition since the crisis um i i don't think that that uh, i don't think that's I think the ones that have forgotten about competition is because they've been lobbied to forget about competition. Because in Europe, uh, if anything, you would think in Europe we had more of an issue of financial stability. And yet we have, you know, if you look at profit margins of banks today, they're not very high. Consumers get a good deal. So I think I think it's fine. On, the, on, on financial stability, I mean, maybe it's too early, but honestly, I think we should be proud of ourselves. I mean, we can always nitpick and say, oh, maybe we really should have put the capital ratio to 20% instead of 16%. But on the other hand, think about it. Like just 10 years ago, we had a major financial crisis. Now we have COVID. We're going to have a recession of the order of 10%, like probably the biggest microeconomic shock ever. And we don't have a full blown financial crisis. And this is thanks to the reform we've put in place since 2010. So at least on that one, I, I think we can be very proud of what we've done. We, I mean, as a community of regulators and, and academics uh, writing on these topics. I know we can always be, you know, we always have a temptation of saying, oh, we should have done more. And I agree, there's plenty of stuff I would change at the margin, I would, I would finish the banking union here, and, and it's not perfect. But on the other hand, if you take a look at the big picture, uh, if you had told me, okay, no, you know, we, we, if you had told me in 2011, okay, 10 years later, we're gonna have a, huge microeconomic shock. How likely is it that it will not create a financial panic? I said, oh, not very high. And yet we are here and there is no financial panic. And uh, I think, honestly, it's an achievement. Well, I hope it lasts, but it certainly makes me realize that we're very, very fortunate that we didn't have COVID in 2006. True. That would, <laughs> that would have been a pretty spectacular and disastrous mess. So now, I think I've exactly exhausted my time in this very interesting and i think pretty all embracing conversation i think we really elucidated i haven't got into health because it's so sui generis uh, american uh, and so completely insane I mean, so i haven't gone that but uh, the other main topics we've covered so i'm going to hand over i think to your saber who's going to um moderate the um the discussion now are uh, the questions from the uh, the audience uh, yes, uh, thank, thank you. you, Martin. Thank you, Thomas, uh, for a wonderful discussion. Uh, since we're all stuck at home, um, and I, but you both have lots of free time, I'm going to lobby you both to maybe start a podcast or uh, something so we can continue to talk about health and everything else. So I expect to be lobbied, uh, Martin and Thomas, on this. That said, uh, we have uh, lots of fantastic questions uh, on the Q&A. Um, let me start with um, a question from our very own uh, Rajesh Chandi. Uh, and it's a question that uh, we talked about the regulatory approach, we talked about merger policy. This is a little bit of a question about the kind of private sector approach uh, to fixing this. So Rajesh asks, if I'm an entrepreneur seeking to compete against entrenched incumbents in a particular industry in the US, what should I do given the situation you've described, assuming I can't hire an army of lobbyists? You go, you go find another place to enter. I mean, like uh, mostly that's what they do. Uh, you just give up. Um, now, of course, it's not completely true. So uh, I think that uh, it depends a bit on the industry. In the telecom case, I think um, if you say you, you, you think you have a better technology or it's a cheaper way of providing uh, you know, uh, fiber and broadband access to households, um, you can start, you can try to enter slowly. Some, in fact, some EU companies are trying to do that. But if you don't get help from the regulators, it's very hard. If you think about the wireless business, it's essentially impossible because you can't enter with a small wireless network. You have to cover, you at least have to enter with the coverage for the entire country. So if you don't have a leg up from the regulator, that's impossible. Now in some other uh, sectors, I think, um, I think the recipe is always the same, which is you, you try to find a good product. Uh, what I find worrisome is more what the VC referred to as the kill zone, which is that um, they are, there is a set of activities that they will not fund because they know they will interfere too much with uh, 
the existing big players. And so they don't want to co copy it head on. So I think that's the main issue. Um, okay, so uh, related to this, but maybe uh, zooming out, uh, more of a big picture question and a few questions in the Q&A have touched on this. Um, Thomas, in the book, uh, you write that uh, one of the lessons you took is that you were surprised to learn how fragile uh, free markets are. Um, and this begs a question, and I think it's a, a big topic nowadays. Is this fragility an intrinsic feature of capitalism uh, that sort of dooms capitalist systems to eat uh, themselves from the inside out? Or is it the case that, for instance, and you guys touched on this in your discussion, that, for instance, Europe has created a better uh, type of capitalism, and perhaps there's a way to fix uh, capitalism? Um, related to that, what is this, uh, how does Chinese capitalism fit into this big picture? Yeah, I think the reason it's fragile, it goes back to Menke Olson's idea of the logic of collective actions, which is, um, you know, it's the fact that an outcome is desirable and may be better for everybody does not mean it's going to prevail. Because uh, to make it prevail, all the beneficiaries will need to coordinate. And it might be difficult. If it's a small gain for a large number of people, they will have no incentive to coordinate. And so the collective action will fail. And in fact, if another scenario uh, exists that would benefit many fewer people, but a lot more per capita, then they might be able to coordinate and impose it. So I think that's the core of the issue. Uh, and that's the, the, the logic of collective action is really the, the, the key issue. Now, we design institutions to be able to counter some of these issues. Um, my takeaway is that um, Institutions, of course, we, we've known that for a long time, obviously, that institutions matter a great deal. But I think um, in that case, it's uh, the fact that um, you know, the market institutions are one among many and uh, competition is also some kind of public good uh, subject to the same um, you know, logic of collective action issues. So we all have an interest in having competitive market, but none of us individually would have much incentive to do anything uh, by yourself. So that's why you need to protect uh, free market. And what that means to me is keep the regulators independent. Uh, I didn't fully appreciate that until I wrote the book. I think having independent regulators that can engage with market participants, obviously, because you need to share the information. It's not as if lobbying is evil, lobbying is necessary. You need lobbies to explain, to make the case for the industry. That's normal, in fact, that's democratic. But the key is the regulator need to have enough of a backup and, and uh, you know, support from their uh, politicians and citizens that they can remain strong and independent. I think that's the key. Can I just yeah. uh, add two little points? Well, one is quite big, I suppose. I mean, I, I am an immense admirer of Mansur Olson, so I agree with everything I knew quite well. But... Uh, of course, this idea that competition, that capitalism or the market economy will eat itself is very prominent in Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations. So right at the founding of capitalism, he talks about um, conspiracies against the public. And the even broader point, and Douglas North wrote a lot about this, is uh, the use of the political system, any political system, pri uh, democratic, uh, of tocratic, whatever, um, by well-connected people who have wealth may be created in the market in order to buy monopoly positions. It's pretty well as ancient as the market system. They were doing it in ancient Rome. We have some quite good stories on that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, a pure market system, which is operates independently of political processes, uh, in a neutral way, completely neutral way, and doesn't exploit its resources. Incumbents don't exploit resources in many ways to protect themselves is a beau ide ideal, but it's not, um, it, one has to fight for it. I think one has to fight for it in every generation. It doesn't, th that's one of the great mistakes of the libertarians to think that capitalism just is all on its own and will continue to be that without effort and of course the problem is that the political system will work against you and yet you have to use it 
uh, so related to this, and I, we talked, you talked about this a little bit, both in the presentation and the discussion, but uh, quite a few people want to dig into this a little bit more. So Richard Portis, for instance, asks, um, you know, what happened in the US? Uh, how did competition policy go so badly off the rails? It seemed to be working in, uh, in the past. Firms were de deterred from even trying anti-competitive M&A. Does Europe not have lobbyists? Should we expect uh, Europe to follow the path that Martin has described? Or is this decentralization either going to break Europe or save it from, these, uh, from this, we can all agree, bad outcome? So the first thing is I, I... I want to be honest that I don't have a full story for the US. I have a full story for Europe because it's slightly easier to understand because there's a clear timing. There is once you create a single market, it's such a momentous event that um, you know there's a before and after. So you can clearly zoom in on that period, understand deeply what's going on, and then you have a full explanation. The US, there is no obvious breaking point. Um, apart from maybe you know September 11 that had a big impact on particular market, the airlines, and a big impact on uh, the political system maybe created some new dynamics um, i think the more plausible story is that uh, it was a long time coming and it was a consequence of uh, the chicago school um, i mean at some point they're saying ideas matter they just don't matter next year they matter over the next 20 years so that's what we saw um, and um, i think that explains part of, of, of the erosion in the us um, now whether for europe um, it's gonna, we're gonna follow the same path necessarily. Um, I hope not. I don't think so for two reasons. One is I don't think the US is gonna get stuck there. I think the US is gonna, at some point, get back to its senses and people, it's about making consumers happy. So at some point you think there would be some kind of, um, you know, political majority in favor of that. The, the only tricky question there, if you think about it carefully, is that, um, it is, you can reach a point in, when the distribution of wealth becomes skewed enough, um, you can reach a point where uh, the wealth weighted median voter doesn't like competition anymore. Because if you get so much of your wealth from the stock market, say from dividends or share buyback, then uh, lack of competition mostly hurts labor income. Um, it, you could have a lot of wealth in the hands of people who actually don't benefit from, from competition, even though clearly it would benefit GDP. So that disconnect is possible. Um, so you have to be careful there. But I think uh, my sense is the US is going to uh, go back to a more sensible policy in the future. Uh, and in Europe, um, there are, again, that's a debate I've had with Luigi Zingales uh, many times. It, you, you, you could argue that Every system is going to get corrupt, just a matter of time. So we are 10 years behind the US, and in 10 years, we'll be just, just as corrupt. That's one view. Um, and the other view is that maybe not, because we created a set of institutions that have their own logic and are going to prevail. I think they are not foolproof, in the sense that they could be undone. But I think they have a strong logic. And as long as we keep vigilant, I think it's likely to stay that way. I hope. Um, one needs all the good. I'm at the moment. I'm. I mean, uh, I, I pray that the EU is going to work in all respects because it's the last bit of human civilization as far as I'm concerned. So, and, uh, so that really matters to me. Um, so I, Thomas is right. Um, did you ask about China? I was about to actually. Yeah, well, okay. No, I, I think I'd like to hear Martin's view about China because... Uh, well, because it's the, a... The China-US China rivalry is something that's been writ writing about and I think it's, to yeah. me, it's the big unknown. It's the big story. So l let me ask about that, and you can both tell me what you think. So indeed, the, this conversation about market power is uh, in the shadow of uh, this enormous giant rising. Um, um, and not only is it an enormous uh, power, but also with some justification, it's been accused of not necessarily favoring a level playing field for its own firms. And so is it uh, naive? to think that Europe and the US can uh, keep fighting the good fight if uh, it's not a fair fight uh, globally. Uh, I'll tie this in with a, with a question um, on the Q&A about South Korea, which uh, is often held up as an example of a country that uh, did great things through creating national champions. So is, is it naive to think that Europe and the US should uh, fight the good fight while uh, not necessarily everyone is uh, following those rules? <laughs> 
Well, this, there are two questions there, both, and I think I'm one of the most profound questions there is how far can the success of broadly speaking, the East Asian economies, so that's Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and now China, be explained by successful industrial policy. And uh, this would then get us into a, an hour long debate, but my own view is not that much, which doesn't mean not at all. And the, I mean, one of the most obvious points is lots of the things they focused on, and I give you a lot of stories, failed colossally. So there's a real survival bias. Obviously, the ones they promoted, which turned out to be world success, like Samsung Electronics, which is just one firm out of enormous number, well, which turned out to be spectacular in line with their comparative advantage and the competitive advantage of the firm. It's a tremendous success. Um, but who remembers fifth generation, was it fifth generation computers? Uh, and uh, high definition tel TV and lots of Japanese failures. So I think uh, I'm fairly persuaded by the people who think that the government's played role. They did some very important things, but you can't say that Japan became Japan because the governments chose the chose the winners. Um, quite a well, there are many examples of that. Um, the China case is, I think, even more striking. This, the view I'm going to give you is the view of all the Chinese economists I know and respect. Um, I don't think anybody has done work like Tomas on China. If they have, I've never seen it. So I really don't know. But my very strong view of China is that um, it was the opposite, that its great success was the opening up of the markets to foreigners, which the, the Japanese and Koreans, of course, didn't do. Uh, the 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 success of the creation of a completely new private sector none of these firms existed 30 years ago um none of them they were all operated essentially outside the system the credit system didn't support them they uh nobody really planned for them they exploded and if you look at the growth of the chinese economy over the last 30 years it's overwhelmingly dominated by new predominantly private firms well, the state sector shrank dramatically. Um, and the great companies, you know, you think of the tech, Alibaba's and so forth, but that was, had nothing to do with the state. But the, the, uh, Tencent, these were, you know, I've been to these firms, talked to the people who created them. They, they, they were operating outside the system. It was anarcho-capitalism, the most extreme kind. Now, then, of course, it was so, and there were many reasons why it was so competitive, by the way. Um, uh, many, many reasons, but one of them was just the economy is growing so fast and so quickly that every industry was opening up and they were all new players because there weren't any others in the play. It didn't exist before. But then, of course, the state realized what was happening. And I see Mr. Xi, I've written about this often, and that will be a long discussion, as the state striking back across the board. And I think he's going to kill China. I think because China is a monster with immense numbers of hardworking, enterprising, brilliant people. Killing it will take quite a bit of work, but I think there's lots of evidence that that's what he's doing. He's monopolizing the economy. He's turning the private sectors into monopolies. He's doing it with the state enterprises. But of course, that doesn't mean that China won't become the biggest economy in the world, because even if it's got half the productivity of the US and Europe, it'll be as big as them both together. That's a reality. So I have a very strong view that this view that we're competing with the Chinese state is wrong. We should be, if you like, if you're a European or American person, you should be praying you're competing with the Chinese state. The problem is you would really have trouble if you're competing with the private sector of China. That's sensational. I think I mostly agree. I mean, uh, from from uh, reading many books and talking to people uh, involved in the process, I think that you could make the case that the most competitive private sector in the world was the Chinese one in the 2000s. Exactly. I mean, if you think cutthroat capitalism had a meaning, these people were not sleeping. I mean, if you look at the hours worked and the, the, the extent of competition, um, and sometimes even like dirty tricks to steal ideas, workers and everything, Somewhere in between 2000 and 2010 in the Chinese private sector, it was amazing. I think it's just pure unhindered private competition, even, you could say even excessive to some extent. 
And I think that's what uh, drove the growth. Um, and if I think that I, I tend to agree with Martin that, you know, the law of history haven't been repelled. Like, you know, the same thing that doomed the USSR, if you repeat them in China, they're going to doom China as well. Like, it doesn't work. You can't have the government run the economy. Um, so the problem is, then let me ask the other, since Martin so brilliantly answered the first half of the question, let me talk about the second half. Um, what, yes, it does create a huge political economy problem in Europe and the US. There is no question about that. Um, I hear here in Washington, uh, a language that is exactly the same I heard in Europe 20 years ago, which is the language of national champions, which is the language of big firms saying, you have to let us alone because otherwise we, you, you can't has, expect us to help you against the Chinese unless we have a big fat monopoly at home. And I think that's very worrisome because I think it's wrong header. This, the historical evidence shows that the best firm to compete globally are the ones who start by having a fiercely competitive market at home. I mean, talking about Tencent and Alibaba, they were engaged in the fiercest of all competition. And then they won in their home market. And there, they were really good at exporting it because they had become so fit. Um, so I think that that argument is, is not true that you need big fat monopolies at home to compete globally, but it's an easy argument and therefore it tends to win politically. Um, and on top of that, you have the trade uh, war issues, uh, which is, not going away, but not only that, I think it's only going to intensify over the next year. So I think that's the main one. Uh, thank you both. Uh, so sadly, we have time for one last question and um, not sadly, we have time for, this is our last question, but I wanted to ask uh, on a topical note, uh, you touched on it. How is this COVID crisis going to shape market power? And importantly, how is the policy response uh, to the COVID crisis going to shape market power? So um, let's start from the obvious. Every recession tends to um, kill more small firms than big firms. This one is no exception. In fact, this one is probably even more that way. So there's a danger that you're going to have a lot of SMEs um, failing and not uh, brought back to life once we exit the lockdown. While the big firms, they can tap liquidity in all kinds of markets and therefore they are more likely to survive. So that in and of itself, means there's going to be a tendency for higher concentration right there. Um, but I don't think it's a foregone conclusion in the sense that I think policymakers can do a lot. If you look at many of the programs implemented in, uh, in Europe, in, in Germany, mostly, and actually uh, many of the other countries in Europe, France, Spain, Italy, got directly inspired by Germany. They've rolled out programs to just make sure the SMEs don't fail. And I think that can be quite successful. So that's the first line of defense. The second line of defense is uh, that, you know, you want to make sure that don't, the, the, the big firms don't get a free pass after the, the crisis is over. Um, that's going to play out differently. I mean, clearly you can already see that, you know, Lufthansa and Air France are treated very differently from EasyJet and Ryanair. That's clearly a big bias in competition. Now, I think it's, I think it's a pity. On the other hand, I think Ryan, Ryan and EasyJet are strong enough that they're going to be fine. But you could already see there that there's a, a, you know, a return to programs that don't work. Um, in car manufacturing, it's a little bit of the same issue potentially. Um, but these are, I think, temporary issues and I, I'm not too pessimistic. Uh, on the tech side, it's a bit different. On the tech side, I think the, game, the, the stakes are very high because um, it so happened that this recession is the one that benefits the firm that were already strong before. And to just to visualize that it's not obvious, imagine that instead of having a physical virus, a biological virus, we had a, you know, a bug in the information system, right? Uh, an electronic virus uh, that would have brought down the internet in various ways. Well, clearly that would have hurt the business model of Google and Amazon more, and it would have made the business model of mom and pop shops and small restaurants better, right? So, it's not inevitable, but it, in this particular instance, it so happened that the shock was a shock that not only was very big, but much weaker or uh, much more benign, if, if sometimes even positive shock actually, for the business models of firms that were already operating online. So that creates a conundrum exposed, which is these are the firms that were already dominant before, they're gonna be even more dominant as we exit. Um, what can we do about it? I think 
to me, two things. First, make sure that Zoom is not a target. Okay, so we are using Zoom right now. Zoom is a brilliant company. The, the product is obviously fantastic. Everybody loves it. Um, uh, and, you know, it's clear that this company needs to remain independent and start to compete with the big guys. That's one thing. And the second thing is, you know, let's push for a faster digital transformation in the rest of the economy. I think that, you know, now every single CEO of every single medium-sized company understand that it's critical to have a very good, you know, online system so they, they can operate efficiently online. And uh, with a little bit of help, they can do it. So I think instead of, uh, in that case, I think we can, we can exit uh, at the top, you know, by just helping the rest of the economy catch up. Thank you, Thomas. On that note, I'm afraid that's all we have time for. Thank you so much, uh, Martin and Thomas. And sorry to all, for all the questions we didn't get to, but I'll put them to our speakers in their upcoming podcast. On that note, I'll hand over to uh, Hélène uh, to wrap up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joseba. And uh, thank you very much to, to Martin and Thomas. This did not disappoint at all. Though I have to say, you agreed a lot. You agreed a lot. And Martin, yeah, I was- We tried quite... hard, I know amazed when you didn't push back on the satisfaction of Thomas, you know, on the banking regulation side, but okay, fair enough. And uh, I saw also... The end of the discussion, at the last minute. But that's true, that's true. Uh, and uh, it will be for another, another day we can discuss that. I was also quite impressed that you were both restrained and didn't talk at all about Brexit and the effect on the future of British competition. Is the UK going to fall on the US side or is the UK going to fall on the uh, European side? I think that that could be a great topic for, uh, for another day. Uh, but in, in any case, I think it was, it was really super to, to hear you. You have given us, I think, the right intellectual apparatus to think about the, the coming months, in fact. Because as Joseba was pointing out, we live through a pretty Darwinian moment to some extent. So there's going to be rapid uh, shift in market shares. And uh, it's not clear that the level playing field is going to be there, given, given the amount of subsidies that we are seeing being poured in, the, in private companies by, by governments. So in order to think that through, I think we, we learned a lot tonight, and we are extremely grateful. And we said, again, thank you so much. That was great. Have a good evening, and stay safe, everyone. Bye. <laughs>